Hello and welcome to Research Methods Lesson 3. In this lesson we're going to cover experimental design. So to help us with the concepts for this lesson we're going to use this research study as a potential experiment. It's the experiment that's used throughout the Green Haired Girl textbook so you've probably come across it before and truthfully by the time you get to the end of year 13 you're going to be sick of hearing about it but for now this is what we're going to use. The question is does drinking speed up energy drink cause people to be more talkative than water? So it works very very simply. Participants are given either some speed up to drink which is an energy drink, or some water, and then the researchers observe the participants and count the mean number of words spoken in the following five minutes, which is then compared between the water and the speed up conditions. Okay, so nice and simple, but that is what we're going to use. So, experimental design is all about the way participants are used in experiments. And when I say used, I'm specifically referring to the way in which participants are arranged in experimental and control conditions. And there are three different ways in which participants can be arranged. Those are independent groups, repeated measures, and matched pairs. And I'm now going to go through how each of them works, and then we'll look at a couple of evaluation points for each of them. So, the first design is independent groups. In this design, participants are split into groups, independent from each other, hence the name. And each group experiences one level of IV. If there are only two levels, the experimental and the control condition, then there are only two groups. And then the results of the two groups would then be compared. So, in our experiment, group one would experience condition A, the speed up condition, and group two would experience the control condition, the drinking water condition. And then afterwards, the mean number of words spoken in the following five minutes would be recorded and compared between the two groups. Nice and simple, nothing too complicated there. Before I move on, just a bit of advice. More often than not, in an exam, you're going to be required to identify the experimental design for one reason or another. So it helps to just have a little one to two mark definition in your head, which will both get you marks, but also help you to distinguish between the different designs. So I've put it in bold in the first bullet point, uh, where it says each participant only experiences one level of IV. If you remember that, that will help you to identify the design being used, but it will also help you get a couple of marks in an exam if you ever come across a one or two mark question that says, identify the design and explain your answer, then you can literally say it's an independent group because each participant only experiences one level of IV. And that'll get you two marks. Right, moving on. Repeated measures is our second design. And for this one, it's the opposite to independent groups because all participants experience all levels of IV. And that is your one-liner to remember it. Okay, All participants experience all levels of IV. And then after that, the mean scores for both conditions would be compared. Okay, So in our speed-up experiment, participants would experience condition A first, which is the energy drink condition. And then afterwards, participants would experience condition B, which is the drinking water condition. And then the mean number of words spoken in both conditions would be compared. And then the final design is matched pairs. And in this design, participants are paired up based on a particular trait relevant to the study and are then split into separate groups. So for example, if our study was a memory study, let's say, participants may be paired on IQ because the researcher may think that higher IQ is linked to better memory. So the researcher gives everybody an IQ test and then the highest and second highest IQ would be paired together and then split into the two separate conditions and then and so on and so on. Okay, And they do that as an attempt to control participant variables that could otherwise impact the results. Okay, So in our experiment you could perhaps pair the participants based on 
how outgoing they are on, or on how chatty they are. So researchers may give them a pre-test or may observe them while they're waiting to conduct the experiment and then might work out who is the most chatty and the second most chatty and those two participants would be paired. And then the third most chatty and the fourth most chatty, those would also be paired. And then they'd be split up and then each partner would experience either condition A or condition B, but not both just like in independent groups. Then afterwards, the results would be compared, just like with the other designs as well. So those are your three designs. Now just to put them into context um, using different examples, have a look at these. Okay, They don't revolve around speed up, um, so ideally just pause the video for a minute or two and just take a bit of time to see if you can work out which design is being used where. Okay, so hopefully you've just had a little look at that. Uh, so if I just pop the bold text up there for you, this is what I would pick out if it was me. So in the first study, participants were paired based on the severity of their symptoms. That's the key phrase that you should have been able to pick out. In the second one, researchers randomly assigned student volunteers to two conditions. And in the last one, um, the important bit is that they were tested before school and at the end of the day okay but that bit of information there in each of them should help you to work out that the first one was a matched pairs because the participants are being um, paired up the second one is independent groups because each student volunteer was assigned to a condition um, and there's no talk of the conditions being switched around or the participants experiencing the other condition and in the last one, it was a repeated measures because all participants experienced all levels of IV. So that's just an example of how it could come up in an exam. Right, let's move on to the evaluation points. Um, for this, we are going to start with repeated measures rather than independent groups, um, just because it allows us to deal with a couple of keywords and phrases that you're going to need going forward. So the big limitation of repeated measures is something called order effects. Now an order effect means that the task completed in one condition could have an impact on the task completed in another condition. And as all participants complete all the tasks in a repeated measures design, order effects becomes a little bit of an issue. So these effects could be something as simple as boredom or fatigue. People who have done the task once may feel like they can't be bothered to do it again, and so their performance suffers the second time round. The effects could also be something that's very specific to the study. So for example, if the participants completed the speed up condition first, the effects of the energy drink could be long lasting enough to affect their performance in the second condition. So order effects can get in the way of getting valid results. Okay, so in order to counteract order effects, researchers use something called counterbalancing. Now counterbalancing works in a very, very simple way. Let's imagine that you have 100 participants. Instead of making all 100 participants do condition A first and then condition B, we're going to split them into two groups of 50. Group 1 is going to experience condition A first, and group 2 is going to experience condition B first. And then, once that's happened, they're going to switch, and group 2 is going to experience condition A, and group 1 is going to experience condition B. Okay, now the point of this is that 50% of the participants are experiencing the conditions for the first time. So half of your participants have got no idea what's coming, which just helps a little bit to counteract the whole order effects issue. And that is known as the ABBA principle, as in A-B-B-A -B -B -A principle. Right, the second limitation of repeated measures then is that demand characteristics can be an issue because obviously the participants will have done the experiment twice and that could mean that they work out the aim of the study which then could lead to them changing their behavior and not acting naturally okay which then impacts the validity of the results however 
pros of a repeated measures design, participant variables are being controlled because the same participants are in both conditions. Okay, so it doesn't matter if you've got a really, really chatty person in condition A and a really, really shy person in condition B because eventually they're both going to switch conditions and then it will just kind of cancel each other out. Okay, so that's a good thing. Also, repeated measures are more economical than independent groups or matched pairs because actually you only need half the amount of participants because all participants complete all conditions. Right, moving on then to independent groups. Limitations first, participant variables can confound the results. Okay, because all participants only experience one condition, there is this issue that if, for example, you have a really chatty person in one condition and a really shy person in another condition, that those participant variables could affect your speed up study. Okay, obviously the participant variables, variables could be anything, um, but just in this case, chatty and shy um, is something that could affect the results. So in order to help deal with that, researchers use random allocation, which is essentially just randomly allocating the participants to one group or another via picking names out of a hat or a random name generator or something like that. It isn't perfect, but it does deal with the issue a little bit, even if it doesn't eliminate it. Also, independent group designs are less economical. You need twice as many participants than are needed in a repeated measures design um, you know, because they only experience one condition. On the upside, there are no order effects in an independent groups. Okay, so they only experience one condition, so their performance isn't going to be impacted in the second condition. Okay, also participants are less likely to guess the aim of the experiment because they've only experienced one condition, which also means that demand characteristics are reduced. Okay. Importantly here, demand characteristics are not eliminated, they are only reduced. Okay. And then finally, we have matched pairs. Um, so a downside is that it is much less economical than the other designs, especially if you need to conduct a pre-test. You need more resources, you need more time, you need more participants. On the upside, order effects and demand characteristics are less of a problem because participants only take part in one condition. Okay, and then we finally got a little bit of a gray area. It's a pro, but it's also a con. So the impact of participant variables are reduced. However, they can never be eliminated completely. Okay, so they're reduced because participants are matched based on a particular trait, which otherwise could have impacted the results. However, it's never going to be a perfect match. Okay, so if you're going to use that point, just make sure that you use it, but also add that little counterpoint on there as well. Don't say that participant variables are eliminated because they're not. They're only reduced and can never be eliminated completely. Okay, bear in mind, please, that I've given you a lot of evaluation points here, but evaluation points work a little bit differently in research methods. You're never going to need to write a full flowing paragraph. They're only ever going to be two markers, give or take. So if you know one or two evaluation points for each of the designs, you'll be fine. Okay, so we are now coming to the end of the video. I hope it's all made sense. From experience, I would say that the stuff covered in this video is incredibly popular in exams, um, even if it's just identifying the experimental design um, and then doing something with it. But it comes up very, very often, particularly in paper two, um, to identify the design, explain your answer, give a strength or a limitation of the design, and then they even sometimes ask you to um, suggest why a different design may be better. Okay, so again, they're testing your knowledge of why the designs are good and why they're bad. Okay, so just keep that in mind um, and make sure that you know your stuff for experimental designs because, like I said, they are very, very popular. So I hope it's all made sense. Um, feel free to pop any questions in the comment section below and I will get back to you ASAP. Thanks for listening.